Hello and welcome to today's webinar on strategic communications. Uh, welcome. So uh, hopefully you've had a chance to play Zoom a bit. So we have the Q&A panel where you can ask some questions and we have the chat panel where we can also have some conversation. So just let me know if um, I've got the wrong screen shared or something like that. And also in the chat, I've got the link to the run sheet. So the run sheet is what I'll be using to um, what I'm talking to. So it's good for you to have a copy of that because that allows you uh, later on to be able to um, you know, reference the links and also keep up with what we're talking about. Okay, so I'm gonna get going. So strategic communications is talking, is talking to your audience strategically, obviously the words. Now, other, other words you may have heard in this context is framing or talking to your target audience. So all these words are, are related. Another definition of this is um, manipulating how people feel and respond. And we're gonna be talking a lot about manipulation today. And um, in that context, that's why I've, I've down the road from Times uh, Square, it's down the road from Coburg and um, addressed as a little bit like advertising exec. Um, so we're gonna be talking a bit about the advertising industry in context to strategic communications. Okay, so why do, should we care about strategic communications, especially as a not-for-profit? Well, you really, uh, we're using these techniques so that you resonate with your audience, so that you can connect with them on more of a human or emotional level. So you can create trust with them and also um, start to bond with them. Um, now, why, why would you want to do that? Um, so you can influence people to act. Um, so depending on what your goals are, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, it also allows you to um, become familiar and for them to recognize you. So if you're using consistent um, communications, um, branding and imagery, then they'll start to recognize you, even, even if it doesn't have your specific name on it. Uh, and then they can then connect with you further. So a little bit more specific about what. Uh, in my uh, opinion, strategic communications is a mix of psychology, graphic design and copywriting, and a few other things mixed in. Now there's a lot of complexity and we're going to cover quite a, an intro to a lot of complex ideas in this workshop, but um, hopefully I'll be able to give you a good sort of overview of some of the things that we're thinking about in, context, in this context. So if you think about it as a film director that's watching a movie. Now, when we're watching a movie, we're getting lost in the story um, and we're in another world. A film director, when they watch a film, is looking at all the camera angles and the, um, the compositions and the stylistic approach and how the scenes are cut and all these different things. So I'm hoping that after a workshop, after this workshop, you'll also start looking at the world you live in, the communications that you're receiving a bit like a film director, um, and specifically the marketing industry and advertising industry. And also um, start to deconstruct some of your own behaviours, which are influenced by the market the relentless marketing that we're exposed to. Okay, so I'm gonna start with um, public relations in the advertising industry, because basically a part of um, not-for-profit uh, marketing is, is the same as being a selling a product, whether you're selling an action or whether you're selling um, an idea or whether you're selling um, an action. So the word public relations and advertising and propaganda is exactly the same thing. It's based on psychological manipulation. So the century of self, and I'm just gonna share screen. That one, yep, share. Okay, so the century of self is a extremely interesting documentary that I recommend everybody that lives in um, a developed country and the developing countries of city-based watch. It's basically the history of psychological marketing. And um, just, it's a very quite long um, group of documentaries by the BBC. Uh, but basic uh, concept is that the marketing industry originally started from uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew um, called Edward Bernays, who then grabbed Sigmund Freud's ideology and then went to 
to credit to the advertising industry to use psychological techniques to then uh, manipulate their marketing. Uh, and then as the documentary goes goes through, it gets to a point where the psychology has been used so much that it stops to work. So then they start using the next generation of psychological research, and then there's a pattern of them thrashing that till it doesn't work, and then using the next generation of psychological research, which is also quite fascinating in today's um, technological driven age about how the tech companies are now using a lot of like new techniques to manipulate people. Now, it's got a lot of examples in there, but I just want to use two examples. Um, the first one was um, a marketing campaign by the smoking industry. So there was a, a um, a parade in the US and this is in the time when um, there's a, obviously a lot different context in, in context agenda and sexism. So it was very social taboo for women to smoke in this um, in this era and so it's sort of seen as a you know a bad thing. So the tobacco industry saw that they're missing out on 50% of their target audience, oh, 50% of a uh, sellable audience. So there's the this parade in america where um if you think of an, a, a traditional american parade where they've got the floats and the marching bands and all that so they staged a feminist protest and this is at the time when feminism was starting to gather some strength and um start you know starting to grow so they've got a lot a heap of women and they dressed them in um clothes which at the time were raunchy and taboo and they crashed this um, parade and created a huge stir. Um, and it was a, quite an influential uh, feminist protest. Now, the thing was that they were all smoking and that was, that was by design. And what that did is not destroy the taboo of women smoking, it, it created the, um, the construct that rebellious or powerful or independent free thinking women would smoke which drove smoking uh, through the roof in the women demographic. Now, if we look at 2020, we now have the largest um, uptake of smoking is in young women. So that um, campaign way back when is still resonating today um, and impacting young women and smoking. The other uh, scene in that documentary that I really um, want to share was an interview with the Nazi propaganda, the head of the Nazi propaganda, and he was commenting on how impressed he was about what was happening in America in context to the adaption of psychology and how they were learning from America and how they were applying these techniques and what they were doing. So you can obviously see where that ended up. Um, the author of um, The Century Herself, um, Edward Bernays, also produced a, quite a, a few um, documentaries. One of them, um, and I'll just stop, um, what is called All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. This is a bit of a hard watch, but it, talking about the concept of how computers are now um, starting to take that role of, of control um, of society. And this is quite a few years ago um, and a lot has changed, but it's interesting to see um, the early ideas. And his latest one is Hypernormalization, which talks about the fact that everything's so complex now that people are just looking for simplicity and that they, they, they just want to like be told what to think. Um, so therefore governments are just outright lying um, and people are happy because they can just keep a simple world. Now that's um, had a lot of heavy crit and one of the crits of that is that is the propaganda journalist now actually producing propaganda. The other interesting book that I um, recommend that you watch in this context, I Epsis, Machines of Love of Grace and Hypernormalization, um, is The Psychology of Persuasion. So this isn't specifically a marketing book, but it's more talking about how um, people are manipulated. And um, a lot of the tricks that your brain does, so your, your brain does a lot of um, uh, techniques for it to filter such a massive amount of um, data and um, 
situations and all that sort of stuff. And so what some pe manipulative people do or the advertising industry does is that they find those tricks and then they manipulate them. So that book's really interesting into actually learning about how the human brain works and those shortcuts that that brain work uses. And another book I rec recommend is Ogilvy on advertising. So he was um, old school um, advertising exec, one of the lead executives. So this, is, this would have been after the era or, or during the later eras of the um, Century of Self documentary. Um, and this is, um, advertising is quite complex. So this is sort of written in a, in a time when things were a little bit more simple. So that way you can like understand some of the basics because the basics of manipulation have never changed. So the interesting thing about um, psychological manipulation is that the people who think they are not malleable, and I use the word malleable because that's a jargon that's used in this sort of um, industry. Um, and malleable means like how you can mold people to do what you want. So people who think they're not malleable are actually the easiest to, ma to be um, manipulated. And so an example of this is a car yard. So if you, if you think of a, a character that's like, I know cars and I'm not going to be able to be manipulated by a salesperson and I'm going to go in there and I'm going to go to the car yard and I'm going to sort out a car. Versus another person that's like, yeah, I'm, I'm not really good with salespeople. Um, they push me around a bit. So I'm going to make a rule. I'm not going to buy a car today. I'm going to sleep on it and do some thinking and maybe some research. And I'm going to buy the car tomorrow. So both of them go to the car yard and the salesperson is able to run rings around the person that thinks that he can um, thinks that he can manipulate um, the salesperson, and the salesperson just manipulates him and makes a sale and all the commissions. Whereas the person who is actually aware that they're not very good at this um, will actually put a big hold um, a big hold on the um, sale so that he they can cool down and actually think about and deconstruct that sales process and actually have a think about um what they actually want from the car so um and as much as anyone studies this you'll still be played and that's useful though because when you're being played you can try to deconstruct it a bit and learn from that so i'm going to give another example and this was from this is from um using psychology psychology in a sales process and this translates directly to um, websites and also not for profits because um, again whether you're trying to sell an action or sell a product is still the same same process so um, the the system um, works on um, the, the bigger picture is we want to work out what their motivations are then what their objections are and then apply scare, scare, scarcity and pressure. So the way that that works out in the context is that they do a telemarketing campaign around the area and make appointments for them to come and see the gym. So then once they come into the gym, the process is at three parts. The first one is the interview, then the tour, and then we reinforce the motivation during the tour and then a close. So the interview, we ask a lot of questions. Um, what motivates you? Why would you want to join the gym? You know, those sort of questions. But they're sort of written in a way that they're not seen, seen as just trying to find their motivations. We also have paper questions about their objections so that we can start to think about what, what motivates them and what's going to stop them. So then when, when we're on the tour, so say that uh, an individual, they came in and their um, problems with their boyfriend, the boyfriend's not... Um, paying them attention like they used to, and they're feeling really bad about that. So they, they hypothesize that it's about their body and that they want to go to the gym to get more hot. So then the, they'll look for their partner. So in that context, when, when say you're showing the weights and the, um, you know, who wants to go, yeah, here's the weights. You can lift heavy things until you grunt and it'll be great. The way it's framed is you can do this resistance work and then that'll increase your metabolic rate and therefore you'll um, start to lose weight even when you're sleeping. And then within a certain time, then you'll have a really toned body and you'll be really hot for your boyfriend. So in that case, you're not selling the weights as uh, something that you're lifting or exercising on. You're selling the weights of what their dream is and that is to have a hot body in this case. So the factoids are actual facts about 
um, weight loss and gyms and things like that that spring win and then mixed with their reinforcing their motivations of wanting to join the gym. Then we come to the clothes. So when we have the clothes, we have two options to buy. Um, one example would be a 12 month upfront um, payment, which would be discounted in cash. And the other would be a 24 month um, monthly payment that doesn't stop. So the, the gym and the salespeople make more money out of the long-term um, monthly payments. However, they want cash up front so that they can pay wages and expenses and stuff. So it's very clear that they should have two options because if there's three options or four options, then they want to think about it and you can't close the sale. So it's really important not to give people too many, um, too many options. Then you want to introduce scarcity. So this offer is only available now. So you have to sign up now. So that way they're not thinking straight and they're not able to make rational decisions or deconstruct it or, you know, do independent research. Um, as well as the scarcity, this is where you're overcoming the objections. So in that context, um, one of the early questions in the tour would be, is your partner supportive of you joining the gym? Now, everyone's partner will be supportive. You know, your mental health will be better, your physical health will be better, you know, you might look a bit hotter, be fitter, all those things. So, of course, any partner is supportive. So, um, in a lot of relationships, people actually share their finances. So, um, a common objection is, um, you know, I'd like to talk this over with my partner about the finances. And then the salesperson would come back and say, yeah, but you told me at the start that your partner was supportive of you coming to the gym. Like, what is there to talk about? So that's a very um, manipulative, um, well-planned um, process for overcoming objections. Um, and so back to websites, this, it's the same, same process. You need to, um, you, obviously you don't get an interview, but maybe there is an environment where you can, where you're um, not selling the, the product itself, but you're selling, selling their motivation for the product. And then you're also overcoming objections. Okay, so ethics with all this that I've talked about. And um, yes, that's a good question because the advertising industry doesn't have money. So that's really important for us um, on the left to, to be talking about ethics of how we're using our data, how manipulating people um, and all those sort of things because um, unfortunately there's a lack of ethics and they're very important. And I'm gonna leave an example this is, I went to a workshop by these people that were building a heavily funded church website. And they were, sell, they were um, raising money to sponsor children. Now, the way that they were doing it was that they'd actually get an individual child and they would package them up with a, a picture and a description and all, all this. And they'd literally go around to churches and sell them as a product. Um, versus a situation where you go, oh, look, I'm going to sponsor a child and from this country and then maybe gender or something like that, but you just sponsor a child. Now, in the context of when you're packaging an individual child, um, you know, what happens to the ugly kids or, you know, what happens to the ones which don't fit in the categories and, and those sort of things. So I'll leave you to decide those ethics. Um, the point the other point was that the church were actually increasing adoptions substantially. So more children were actually getting fed. So that is very, you know, um, a gray area of ethics. And so it'd be interesting to, to think about. Okay, so um, copywriting. So I can't talk through too much about copywriting because I'm not a very skilled um, writer myself. I'm more of a visual, um, skills and visual area um, but I've worked with copywriters enough to really make the point that is there is an art to writing and I work with a lot of clients that are um, um, you know I did high school English I can write you know I write reports all the time um, so I can do my copy for my website I can save some money um, that is actual nonsense um, because there are specialist people that have specialist skills and it's an art and a passion and they can write far better copy so you may save some budget by writing the copy so that you can brief the uh, copywriters. And that's what I do is I'll write the copy. Um, so I, so the copywriter knows what I'm doing, then I'll give it to them and then I'll brief them and then they'll remix my copy. 
So um, never doubt the art of copywriting, even if you don't understand it. Now, if you've got no budget, you can't use a copywriter. And when in doubt, always refer back to your character personas that we did um, in previous webinars. And they're the, um, they're the personas you've created of your target audience. So this is who you're talking to. And also your brand persona, which we're going to talk about um, following this. So if you're using your brand persona to talk to your character persona, then um, you know, you're going to roughly be in the right direction. And I put in the term there, searched optimized sales copy, um, because this is a very, just to show you a specialized type of writing. So when search engines started to get um, influential, people started doing search optimized copy. Now, if you looked at it and read it, it looked like a robot had read it, had written it, and it was written for robots. Now you have sales copy, which is you know, aimed at selling. So um, if we look at some of the previous examples, um, so it was actually a really good, really um, strong skill to be able to write sales copy for humans that is also targeted at robots, which is search optimized. So this is an idea of how um, specialized copywriting can be and hopefully some respect for that. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about graphic design. Um, and my background is um, a sign writer, sign fabricator, and I did a diploma of graphic design multimedia. Um, so it's a passion close to my heart. Um, the the eye is the most evol most important evolutionary tool. This is argu arguably. Um, however, uh, I went to a talk at the CSIRO, um, and some scientists were talking about the evolution of the eye. And once the eye it, um, came into being, then there was a massive acceleration of um, evolution. Um, and, the, and humans use our eyes as a, one of our primary senses. So just imagine how you'd navigate the world without your eyes, for example. Um, it is a language. It's not just, you know, we're looking at pretty things. There's a whole language of uh, called graphic language. Now, every everybody, in our society learns this. They learn it alongside a verbal language. And what graphic designers and other visual communicators and artists do is they actually learn that, that um, language in the same way as um, someone who's studying um, English literature would be learning um, English in far more detail. Um, a visual communicator is learning the visual languages in far more detail. So I would recommend um, the a book, um, Centrals of Visual Communication. Um, this was actually a textbook when I was at school. Um, and this is a really great book that goes through um, the, a lot of the principles of visual communication, the aspects, and also different mediums like film, um, you know, um, print, uh, billboards, that sort of stuff. So um, that is a really good um, book. Now, if you're low on budget, I recommend go to libraries. Now, libraries actually do have quite a lot of books on um, visual communication, the basics of graphic design, that sort of stuff. So um, you may want to save that purchase until you've checked out the library and see what they've got. Um, any sort of graphic design books, how to do graphic design books, I really recommend um, reading because um, it is a language, it is a system, and it can be learned. And um, you would need to learn it to be um, a good at what we do here. I just also want to mention the difference between art and design. And a lot of times there is no difference. Like you've got artistic designers and, and um, artists that are designing, et cetera. There's a lot of uh, overlap. Um, we're all using human emotion. We're using systems. We're using the same language. Um, my definition though is art doesn't need a point. Art could just simply be an expression, whereas design does have a point. You have, usually have a brief and then you're trying to actually do something or communicate something. Um, but that debate's um, fine. You can have that um, over beers um, with artists and designers. The other important aspect of um, visual communication is actually human body language. 
So, um, and you'd know this say when you're talking to a baby, just using facial expressions, is that they will already start to respond and understand you. This is before they've learned visual language, uh, sorry, written language or um, verbal language. So we're already programmed to use body language. So one example was they did a study and if you have a, a, and this affected men a lot more, but if you had a woman on the front of a website and she was looking at a certain way, then um, usually do a call to action, say a button that says book now, then a um, majority of people would follow her gaze to where she was looking and then be positioned at that button. So body language is, is quite important for visual um, language. The other uh, really important um, aspect is um, color psychology. Um, and I'll just jump to here. I um, mean, this is a quick Wikipedia look, but you can see like how much detail that we're going through. That's um, now we're also looking at um, the influence of colors on people and um, how they um, influence people. Uh, and then, I mean, this is one grid and there's lots of, I mean, this isn't an exact thing, so it's, it's vague, um, but um, there's a lot of different frameworks out there. Okay, so when I was a student, I was um, living in a sunroom and it was very cold in winter and very hot in summer because I had the main room as my studio, which is more important for an artist. So I was reading um, complex books in color psychology and so I decided to give it a go. So what I did is I put, um, in winter, I put big um, red sheets of card um, and covered the wall. I made, made the whole room red. And in summer, I covered the whole room in blue. Now that had the effect of changing the temperature by a few degrees. It didn't change the degree, the temperature as far as the science, but it did as far as the psychology. Um, and it actually worked really well. Um, so color has a huge influence. So when we're working with visual communication, color is really important. Um, another example is prisons. So prisons are usually um, painted green um, or soft hues of blue. This is because they're calming colors. Um, they, don't want, they don't want to have um, colors like red and orange because that's more emergency and angry colors, uh, which, will, which does have, and it's been studied to increase the level of violence in prisons, whereas green has decreased the level of violence um, in prisons. The other thing with color that's important is um, functionality. So contrast, so how different things can be read on, on um, against each other, how typography can be read um, against different colors, those sort of things is really important. Um, so color as well as the psychology also is really important for functionality and how things work. So in the background there, you can see certain, certain color schemes like the red and the orange, the blue and the orange doesn't, isn't easiest to read as say the black and the white, for example. Um, now, typography is another really important tool used by visual communications. So type has a personality. So different fonts have a different meaning. So for example, Comic Sans, if, if you look at Comic Sans, you'll have a feeling towards it, it has a personality. Um, it, although some fonts now have been used so much that they've lost their personality. So Helvetica, for example, is the most used font in the world. So therefore it's become sort of without personality. But in saying that, if you're a designer and you choose Helvetica, you're actually deliberately making a decision that you want that font to have minimal personality um, and you would have a strategy of why you'd be doing that. Versus you may want a flowery, um, you may want a flowery um, a font which, um, which then um, you know, has that um, personality of um, being you know, more hippie or flowery or, or whatever. Okay, so imagery, actual just imagery um, itself. I've just got a credit saying that the text is mirrored. So I actually flipped this image so it wouldn't be mirrored. So are you seeing it mirrored on your side? I'm sorry, I'm getting my zoom backwards. Um, okay, so color uh, photos are really, really important um, uh, for many reasons. Obviously, the photo behind me is, is saying something and it's got a, an impact. 
And uh, photos has a, there's a, a, a lot to photography. The style of the photography, the quality of it, the subject, and how we treat it. So I'm doing a webinar on images. Image tells a thousand words coming up. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about imagery, how to choose imagery, how to find imagery, um, how to shoot imagery and work with photographers. Um, illustration and art is, um, is, even, is even more complexities. Uh, and then a lot of the um, art techniques can be used for visual communication. So one example was I was working with um, Australian children with a disability. And they were working through the ethical issues of including children on the website because, I mean, there's a lot, lot of stuff with that. So they were considering then using illustration instead of the photography um, to get around that. So then we went through um, a process to work out, well, what style of illustration um, would represent them? Um, you know, what style would be, we, do we want to make it really kiddie like or do we want to make it more professional looking or, do we, how do we show their dignity and, and those sort of things? So the illustrative style was really important because a lot of people are gonna read from that. Um, layout is really key. This is where you're putting things. Um, because we read um, visual communication like we do like a book. So with um, the English language, we read left to right and down. And we tend to read a little bit similar with visual visual layout simply because of our language reinforcement. However, there are some, some, some differences and those can be also been manipulated. They can be manipulated by um, colors and sizing of things, contrast, fonts, um, images, all those sort of things. So you're actually controlling how someone's reading it. So if you wanted a website where you wanted to introduce the concept and then um, overcome some objections, so you might say, do they trust us? So you might have an award there and a testimonial and then a call to action. So then you'd actually put them in that order and you'd, you'd also um, apply colors and sizes and all those things so that someone will read one, two, three. Okay, so a basic header of a website, uh, maybe I'll just jump one. So a standard website is logo on the left, menu on the right. So, as boring as that sounds, that has now become the, a rule around, um, around, interface, around lay, website layouts. So that means that someone doesn't even have to think about it um, when they're looking at that layout. So if you've, unless you've got a good reason to change that layout, um, maybe your brand personality um, is wanting you to have something a bit more interesting, then um, I recommend staying with that layout. Um, and then some other things um, that, are, that come into it, and this is only a, a sort of a snapshot of the major things, because um, obviously I'm just going over these things as an intro. Uh, texture is very important. Do you want something shiny or fluffy? Um, and then things that aren't visual communication at all, things like sound. Um, so for example, the, um, the noise of the Harley Davidson has been part, painted in as their brand by their brand. So you can't produce a motorbike and sell it. This sounds like what a Harley Davidson has registered. Okay, so um, I wanna create a scenario. You've come to visit me, and then after you've visited me, you're going to, you've got a busy evening. You're going to, um, you're going to um, head to some a work after party. So there's gonna be all your work colleagues there. And then you're going to, um, catch up with some family really quickly. And then you're gonna go out with some of your close friends and have a party. Now, while you're at my house, you, um, you know, have some baby cuddles and um, that's always great. Um, but the problem is the baby vomits all over your shirt. And so I'm like, don't worry, I've got a shirt. In fact, I've got four shirts. Um, and good news is they're all the same. Like they're about saving the planet. So I want you to choose one of these shirts. And then I um, want you to, in the, in the chat, to say which shirt you've chosen. Okay, so top left, number one, top right, number two, bottom left, number three, and bottom right, number four. Which shirt do you wanna choose? And what I'm looking at is just not the number, 
I want you to tell me why you've chosen. This is the key thing. I want to know why you're choosing that shirt. I want you to start deconstructing your psychology. And in this context, we assume it's the right cut for you and it's the right size. And um, you know, if you if you prefer more feminine shirts, then it's feminine or for you want, you know, whatever. Now that we've talked a little bit about what strategic communications is and, and the psychology and graphic design, now I'm going to get very um, specific about um, brand personality. So in this context, if we're building a website, we want to know how to brand it. Um, but more specifically, if you're starting an organization, then we want to know how to brand it. Um, and the, the, this process usually can cost a lot of money um, if you're like a big organization and go through this process. But I'm going to show you just a bit of an intro, introduction snippets of it. So then hopefully you'll be able to do that. Um, be able to do that yourself. Um, be able to at least go through the basics and start getting a brand together. Um, or, uh, or if you do have budget, it will allow you to be able to work with a designer to actually produce a um, brand. Because if you just go to a designer and go, I need a logo, um, generally you'll get a bad logo that won't work. Whereas if you're learning and thinking about the stuff that we're going to go through today, then um, the chances of you getting a good logo are probably pretty good. Okay, so intro, what is a brand? Can people um, shoot through on the chat what they think a brand is? Just wanna see where, where people are at with um, just the word brand, an image that people associate it with, icon, concept of a business or product, yep. It's a consistent image that makes one think of the products they sell. Yep, so that all these are, are right and, and close. Um, so a brand is a is a, um, a group of elements put together to, to represent them. So logos, fonts, um, styles, um, noises, etc. Um, now the question is: a brand a per person can a person be a brand? Um, and definitely. And I'll use the Mark Zuckerberg um, example uh, later in the context that he has a personal brand and he is a brand. Okay, so back to the t-shirts. Social status and personal identity. So I wanted to run that through because it was interesting how you were giving, I'm gonna scroll back up to them. So if you wanna scroll back up to those questions. Everyone gave me a conscious answer, but no one gave me a subconscious answer. The thing is when I um, talked about, you're going to go to your family and then you're going to go to your work colleagues when you, and then you're going to go to your friends, you are making the decisions on how, how people are going to um, see you in that shirt. Um, it was about your feelings. That's why if I made the brief a bit different to say, okay, you're just going to see, you're just going to go home. You'd be like, I'd probably get the badass shirt whereas I'm actually going to go in public. And a lot of people, when we're talking about branding, this is about their, their, them themselves, like their social status. Um, so it'd be interesting if you, if we, and I'm not going to deconstruct uh, anyone individually, but if you, you look at your answer and have a look at that is like how that answer um, translates to how you feel about how you'd feel in that shirt to your, about yourself and how that influenced your decision, whether you're going to see all these different people um, influence the, that shirt would influence, influence your social status and the personal identity that you're um, wearing that shirt. So the clothes that you choose, for example, um, just in a normal day today is about your personal identity and that also links with your social status. Now this is really key because um, it's this psychology of, that a lot of brands hook into. So um, a lot of prestigious uh, brands, you know, your luxury brands, they're selling a social status of high wealth. Um, and the person who wears that has high wealth. Um, so in some uh, low, in low um, 
wealthy countries with low wealth, there's a phenomenon where they spend a lot of money on their clothes um, and they'll buy fancy design labor clothes and that sort of stuff because that's showing their social status to others. They're using um, those, those brands as visual communication to other people to show that they believe that they have those attributes. So a lot of the brands just manufacture what people want to feel um, and what they want to communicate. So branding is not just the company communicating to you, it's you using that brand to communicate to others. Um, and there's a lot of personal psychology in that. So um, it's interesting when I look at people that are wearing lots of brands, um, one, I can deconstruct what, what they're trying to portray simply because of what the brand's advertising is trying to portray. But then also I would think that they wouldn't have much of a personality because they're needing to use these brands to actually show that they have some sort of personality um, versus somebody who's um, got much more complex, um, you know, wearing complex stuff, which I maybe don't work, can't work out. Um, so yeah, it's also yeah important to start thinking about that psychology of that. Um, so so did that? Could you um, just go back to the chat? Um, something to how how does that how does that feel that t-shirt um, exercise? If we reframe that in more of a social status personal identity, yeah, I still would have chosen number three. I agree because my point is that the reason that you chose it is more, I believe that everyone would still choose the same t-shirt. What I'm saying is that the reason you chose it is more complex um, and has a subconscious view, not just the, um, not just the, um, the reason that you gave. So for example, it's the least offensive to more people. So your subconscious is that you don't want to offend people. You just want to, to you just want to be chill and not deal with, with people. So you've chosen a less offensive shirt because that's reflecting on how you're feeling today of not wanting to be offensive or just generally not wanting to be offensive. Um, yep. Yeah, so I tend not to st towards standing out. So in that case, you're going to, you're going to be looking at a shirt that doesn't stand out. So they, these are some interesting ways of thinking about it because the, because Brands are looking at manipulating you in that context. So if they're, they're um, targeting someone that's in your, you're in their target audience, then they may wear one of these shirts that they know that you're going to resonate with, um, if that makes sense. So if I asked a, a public speaker, what shirt would they wear? Um, they would be choosing it for the, for the reasons um, a lot more um, deliberate about I'm choosing this because the way it's going to make me appear with other people um, where you are still choosing it for the same reason, um, how I'm going to appear to other people, um, but we're just defining it a bit different. So I just want to, to tease that out uh, a little bit more, just to start thinking about ourselves and how we are, everyone's a visual communicator um, and everyone's an artist. I mean, I mean getting dressed in the morning, um, even in isolation, you, you know, you're still communicating. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like similar if one wears a suit or more casual clothes, like um, we simplified it with a t-shirt, but then if we've got someone who's dressed as a goth, someone who's dressed in a business suit, someone who's dressed as you know, raver clothes, um, and all these sub subcultures take on their own um, visual communication to show. So say if you think of a punk, and it's a bit past it now, but say in the 70s, you can communicate to your subculture that you're more into the subculture than other people by having more extreme expression of that. That means if you're full punk, you can't actually go into other subcultures, um, but then you're going to be more successful in that specific subculture. So if you're marketing to that subculture, say if you're the Sex Pistols, then you can then um, really amplify that so that then they can resonate with that, that subculture's communication. Um, so a brand has elements and attributes, um, fonts, colors, imagery, styles, noises, sounds, all that sort of stuff. Um, graphic style. So um, this is important as well. So um, for example, you may, your graphic style might be, we have a vintage style. So we will put vintage filters on of our stuff. We'll try and have a black and white, etc. Or we only use really sharp professional imagery. Um, so when we're choosing photography for my website, um, 
I always group styles together. So if, if I've got a shot that's really well professionally shot, I won't then use a shot that sort of, you know, looks like it's done by an amateur. Um, I'll match, make sure they're all professional shots or if they are amateur shots, um, and then I'll try and group the styles together um, just to give that harmony. Um, it's also a language. So what language are you using? What words would you use? Um, if you're selling medical equipment, you're going to be using a lot of jargon. You're going to be you're going to be writing really sophisticated um, language that maybe not everyone understands. Whereas if you're aiming just at the general public, say you're just selling um, selling clothes, then you'll just have very simple language that everyone can understand. Uh, and a style guide. So a style guide is um, basically a collection of all the elements and also instructions on how to use it. Um, so a very simple one might simple have the fonts and may have the color schemes and a logo on it. Um, and then some of the more that are more um, advanced ones would actually have um, a lot more detail about how they use imagery, how they use um, all that sort of stuff. So I've just put up some um, examples on the internet. And if you search for a style guide, um, there's so much on the internet that if you actually search style guide, not for profit or style guide, um, this or that, you'll come with much more specific things. Um, but this talks about what I'm going through, but I'll let you do that in your own time. Da -da -da -da. Um, 99 Designs is a tool that allows you to outsource cheap design. So they've got, um, this is more aimed at sort of the smaller people because the big corporates um, are on a different ball game with this stuff. I think the Commonwealth Bank logo, that square yellow with a bit of black cost a million dollars for them to design that logo. So, um, and here's some different examples. So I'll talk to you a little bit about, um, so it's really important that you've got your branded sorted, even if you're just doing a rough job of it, because um, this will then allow people to connect with, with you, be able to, they're going to be subconsciously judging you the whole time, um, whether they act or not. So this will actually allow you to um, control that narrative, control how people feel about you um, and connect with them and resonate with them. Now, if you see somebody wearing your t-shirt, then you've done a great job because someone is now using your, um, what you're trying to communicate is good. Um, you've done such a good job that they are now they are now using that to communicate to other people that they have these attributes. Um, so it's always um, if you're doing this sort of um, brand personality stuff, if you actually see someone wearing your shirt or something like that, then shows that um, somebody's resonating with your brand enough that they want to then broadcast to others that that's that's their um, attributes that they want to be seen as. Um, and personal brand. So Steve Jobs. Now, uh, I'll talk about Steve Jobs and Nicole Kidman. So who knows how Steve and Nicole live in their own, own homes? Um, I don't know what pajamas they wear and how they act and behave. The only thing that I know about these two people is the public persona that I see. Now that's manufactured, it's not real. The Steve Jobs and Nicole Kidman we see is simply not real. It's, it's a, a part of them that they've fabricated, um, that they've created. Now, Steve Jobs has a very zen house. Now, maybe, maybe one of his houses is very zen. And then when he wanted to project that as his brand personality, so maybe when, when the interview, the media came over, he went to his zen house and then acted all zen. Like, or maybe he is zen. The point is, like, that zen house could be fabricated. And so Steve is really good at that. And I assume he also would have had advisors and all that sort of stuff that would have curated um, Steve Jobs um, as a brand. Because Steve Jobs as a brand was very um, important um, as part of the Apple brand. Um, and the two supported each other. Um, and so there would have been a lot of work and uh, money put in in the Steve brand because it supported the um, Apple brand worth a lot of money. The Nicole Kidman brand, well, Nicole sells, she is a brand, like that's what she sells. Like 
she can um, command higher wages for the next movie because she has that brand and that following. So for her personally, it's important for her to maintain that brand. Um, so again, who knows what, how she is in real life. She might be nothing, completely nothing like what she is, or maybe she's completely what she's like. Um, who would know? Um, and Mark Zuckerberg is a clear example. Um, you know, Mark is a bit of a dick, um, well known as one, not many people like him. Now, a few years ago, they were about to drop the largest public sale of a company in history. And Mark being an idiot um, and not well liked, was gonna affect how much money they could make. So they quickly wheeled in the experts. They sat there and created a brand personality. They, they got him, obviously he would, it's, it's still a manifestation of him. It's not just totally made up, but it's a manifestation of what he, he is, but then what he should be. They dressed him, they talked about his language. He would have been doing language coaching um, about how to phrase things, how to use language. Um, you know, they would have, he would, kept the same clothes, those sort of things. Then they wheeled him out before the sales to the, to the um, lectures and the, the um, interviews and those sort of things. And then um, they, they made him look better and then they sold Facebook for a fortune. And if you fast forward to when he's sitting in court and um, over the um, Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, Mark was looking quite different um, as, a, as a brand than he was before the sale. Um, and it, if, if you're a, um, and we all do our own brand personalities and some of us, some people are more um, career focused. So they'll only in public, certain settings behave certain ways and then in other settings they'll behave other ways. And some people will just be, I am my own brand and then they'll just be the same in all environments. Okay, we're back. Um, yeah, I had a question about the backdrop to um, today while I'm using it. Um, this is a um, picture of Times Square. And the reason I want to use it is simply to show how gross advertising is. Um, we're talking a lot about manipulation and the advertising industry and psychological manipulation of people. So um, I just wanted to walk down the street from downtown Coburg and um, just show an example of uh, just, you know, what this becomes. And this is also an icon of the power of America and how this is a good thing. Um, so you interpret how you will. Um, what would be some good commercial campaigns for us grassroots people to learn from positively? Um, there, are, There's a whole um, industry of um, media around marketing. So blogs and um, conferences and all that sort of stuff. So I wouldn't have a good example off the top of my head, um, but I do recommend looking into mainstream marketing as much as, um, mainstream marketing as much as like not-for-profit marketing um, examples, because um, at the end of the day, we're trying to communicate with people and it's people that are, um, you know, come from all walks of life. Um, and the we can learn from the mainstream marketers that have got big budgets and no ethics, and we can see what's happening there. And then we can interpret that with our smaller budgets and our higher ethics thresholds, I hope, um, so that we can then try to get a happy medium about what we're doing. Um, and we've just got a shout out to um, Sea Shepherd and this, uh, Sally sent a few examples of um, some stuff that um, works as well. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, producing a brand personality. And by brand personality, um, there's lots of different definitions and um, language. So I'm more going to talk about what I, I define as a brand personality. And this is, it's an internal document. So it's not a mission statement um, or any of those sort of things, which is designed for external communications. This is an internal um, framework. Um, uh, and it's really important because this is a brief for our curatives. Um, so we really want to um, when we're communicating to our graphic designers, our logo designers, our photographers, our copywriters, this is the brand personality. So we can give that to them and say, this is our personality. Everything you produce must be within this personality. Um, so that gives them something then to hook onto, to be able to then um, continue to write. 
So the way that we um, we start with this is that we start just brainstorming objective words. Um, and so I'm going to share screen and just pull up the um, the devised briefing document that we looked at yesterday, um, because part of that has some of these imagery, some of these words, uh, this page here. Okay, so these sort of words, approachable, corporate, high tech, modern, helpful, caring, humble. Um, words like inspiring um, aren't very useful to us. And it intends that nearly every time I've run um, one of these workshops, like not, not the education ones, but the ones actually developing word, uh, brand personalities, everyone says inspiring. Now inspiring doesn't mean it's just waffle. Like there is no way that we can choose an inspiring color or an inspiring font. Um, so we want things that we can actually um, talk to. So, um, you know, slick. So, you know, as a designer, I can go, okay, so we really want to have a, a slick font, um, shiny, we'll be using shiny shapes. Um, the, we'll be using um, some of the techniques of graphic communication to show that this is slick. Um, something that's humble is quite different to something that's authoritarian. Um, so uh, an example of that is the banks. So you would have seen um, probably, 10, 20 years ago, the bank's brand personality was authoritative. Now they wanted to be like a father figure that's trusted with money. So um, their focus was on trust. And so a lot of their communications um, and personality was, was about them being the authority in the community. Now, if you fast forward to now, what we have is more um, banks trying to be your best friend and banks being your mum. Um, all the advertising now they're putting out is like them being very family and friendly and um, those sort of things because they've evolved to, to be more sophisticated that they want to have more of an intimate relationship um, and have that more the feeling that they're friendly and nice that you can go and speak to them because the problem with authoritative is they're not friendly welcoming or nice so um, they wanted to switch those that brand around um playful sophisticated um natural organic versus high tech um you can mix these things so then what we do is we grab um let me just jump back to my browser um oh and also this um this is linked on the run sheet so you, this is a free download as well if you want to use this briefing document um, okay, so here's one that I'm working on for action skills. Um, this was work we did last year. So our words that we're using, we're professional, we're friendly, we're practical, we're helpful, we're creative and we're natural. So as a designer, the way that we can translate professional would mean that we'd need um, to follow the principles of design. So it would, would be at a certain standard of our design um, so that we're not looking cheap or dodgy or around the edges. We're not looking for a punk aesthetic. Um, however, we don't also want to be slick. Like we've got, we're wanting a friendly welcoming. So um, at the moment, I'm just got a blue color for the um, website. So that's not really friendly or welcoming. So, and again, it's, um, I've done an agile approach on both the brand and the website. So it's in progress, practical, um, so just by what we're doing, we've got a heap of free stuff, um, helping people and being helpful. So you have free webinars, for example, creative. So the next step for our brand personality would be to start getting some more creative application on our imagery. So, um, we'll be using some more, you know, fancy graphic design to look a bit creative, but then we'll always still be rooted in more of a natural organic feel. So we're not going to be looking for slick, shiny. Um, so these words are now helpful for us to be able to um, pitch our copywriting, pitch our um, graphic design, start thinking about images, like what images would we use in this context? Um, so if it's important to um, ask the question, can a graphic designer use, use this or copywriter? So if it's inspiring, if, if, if action skills was inspiring, like it's not useful for a copywriter. 
So um, the next step, um, which hasn't been done on this, is um, creating a sentence. So you want to describe it a little bit. Um, so as if you're describing a friend that goes down the uh, other pub, you're describing a friend, you know? They're very, uh, my friend's very professional and friendly, um, and, um, but they're very helpful and creative or something like that. Um, it's generating that sentence that's the hard bit. So you are, again, and the previous webinars, you'll notice that I'm a big fan of humanizing things. And also with your brand, it's important to humanize it. Um, uh, and also earlier asked the question, like, is a brand a person? In that context, we've got, um, we've got corporations being legally registered as persons. Um, and I think it's really important to frame your brand personality as a person. So if you're thinking about your company or your organization or your campaign as a person, how would you describe them? Like, what is their personality? Um, and the reason that it's useful to humanize it is because as humans, we're, we're just used to um, interacting and judging and um, deconstructing you know, other human attributes uh, in the same way. Um, how does a description sentence relate to a headline or a tagline? Well, it would lead to a headline or tagline. So this, this is developing the personality. So then we can create a tagline or a um, headline that represents the personality, if that makes sense. Um, so that's why I say this is an internal thing because um, it's not something that goes external. It's, um, it's so then we can make sure our headlines and our taglines, our mission statements, our, you know, our power text rep that reflect this. Um, so my device um, brand personality was professional, um, no jargon and um, sense of humor. So I, my copywriter um, rewrote all of our copy um, and we had a few jokes in there. Um, this is selling mainstream websites, a few jokes in there. We stripped all the jargon, kept it really short, so, but never unprofessional um, because there's so many web companies out there and most web companies um, talk tech and they talk um, googly gook no one can understand. And so we were like, no, let's um, just talk to people on their level, um, still be professional um, and, and have a bit of personality. Okay. Um, yep, yeah, so an ideal contact is a description sentence. So once you've got that, then you can start, um, you can start building on some of the other things. Um, so if I jump down to this document here, I've just started doing some copywriting. Um, I just sort of free throw all over the place, blah, blah, blah. Um, but down here, I did start looking at it. Um, so the imagery I'm starting to look at is people. Um, and the thing we're talking about there is, is some of our words are like friendly and um, helpful. So doesn't it make sense that we've got people in our imagery? Um, people also resonate with people um, and it just makes us more human and friendly. Um, now, when you're including people in your imagery, it gets very complex very soon. Um, you know, you're looking at gender issues, race issues, um, you know, class issues, how they dressed, all that stuff. So it's gonna be quite complex for us to be able to choose imagery or whether we're gonna shoot imagery because the amount, we will need to deconstruct that quite um, extensively. So for example, for Australian NGOs, um, most of stock, stock footage um, of mixed race people are American. And that doesn't just juxtapose generally um, onto an Australian context because um, we have a different mix or, or whatever. So they, a lot of the times look quite cheesy. Um, so anyway, that's for me to be struggled with. The other design imagery we'll be looking at is nature photography. Um, skies, vast landscapes. Now skies, from a practical point of view, make really good backgrounds because they're um, very minimal, not very cluttered. Um, but then what we wanna do is put an illustration layer over it so that we're still giving it some personality and we're making it more than just an image. Um, so we'll be doing some um, experimentation on um, illustration in that context there'll be more like flourishes or um, embossing or you know putting patterns over it just so that it 
doesn't look like a stock image thrown in there. Um, so it actually looks like it's, um, there's a lot more creativity going into it. And then that um, illustration um, style will then go through the whole website so that you'll be able to see that style go through. And then when we start publishing our social media and those sort of things, um, then we can also use that illustration. And then I'll likely update even the YouTube videos I'm producing at the moment. I'll go back and um, put those graphics into those. Um, okay, so we started working on a logo and we started with an icon, an Australian animal icon. Um, and we went um, a lot of work trying to find something that was um, unique and we just couldn't. Um, all the easy pronounce names of animals have been taken. Um, we did a lot of research to find anything. So we've, we um, moved to more of a network looking type logo and that was a different process. Um, some of the things we're looking at is being very influenced by solar punk. If um, anyone um, is familiar with that um, sort of movement, um, graphic design movement. Um, and again, using skies, animals, illustrative design. Interested in origami as a, um, a graphic style and looking at icon iconography. So that means using logos and symbols. Um, there's huge libraries out there to use. Um, and here was the process we went through with a few few people is that we um, we hear some of the um, people put down some suggestions and um, we went through and shortlisted them so yes no yes no and then we keep shortlisting keep shortlisting da, da, da. okay storytelling um, I'm not going to go into huge detail, but I really want to introduce, um, it's a really important key is storytelling. Um, it's becoming a lot more of a buzzword at the moment and much more of an approach. And, um, it, it, I think it's not a, it's not a fad. It's definitely something that's to stay. And the reason, um, I think storytelling is so important to communications, um, and strategic communications is it's the traditional human knowledge transfer. Before we had written knowledge, written language, we had verbal language and um, knowledge was passed down through generations. Um, be before we had TV and before we had um, books, we were telling stories. Even though, and books are stories, um, television is stories. So a big part of our, um, what is human is actually storytelling. So we are um, trained, um, storytellers, but we're also used to hearing stories. So we're going to resonate to it a lot more. And it's about being human, like we're human and we tell stories. And so I'd also pitch to emotion versus data is boring. Now, the climate scientists in the um, first wave of climate change um, communication failed miserably. And what they uh, went for is they went for data you know, the hockey graphs and the, um, all the different things that were going to communicate, um, you know, the climate change impacts and all that. Now that resonated with some people. Um, some people um, will relate to facts and figures. Most people won't. Um, and most people found it boring and switched off or they just couldn't interact with it. So in that context, the next wave of um, climate change um, communication is being more emotive and more storytelling, telling stories of people impacted by climate change or telling stories of scientists of, of doing this and um, much more of a trying to connect with humans directly about the, um, the science and the impacts of climate change. Now, I'm not saying that we should get rid of data and, tell, and just tell stories. Um, it, it's just different tools that you would use. Um, or you may um, tell stories about the data um, or make that data more interesting in a, in a um, narrative based construct. Um, and again, depend on your audience. If your audience is pure scientists, then sure, throw them graphs, they love that stuff. But if you're trying to connect with more mainstream people, um, emotion is far more important. Um, and if we get back to the um, hyper normalization um, documentary, if, if that is true what they claim is that it's too complex for people and they just want to be told what to do then a story is going to be far more resonating um, with them than um, sending them some data okay so uh, if you're new to storytelling um, and don't have much skills on it then you can look for frameworks and frameworks help uh, things that help you tell stories 
So I've got two examples of um, frameworks and one is called the um, conflict drama triangle, but basically you've got a victim, a villain and a hero. And between the three, you can create a story and tell your story about that. Um, so here's an example of interface design. Um, so on the left two panels, we've got Lead State Forest um, and how to get there. Then we got Whitehaven Coal, which is the company that's just, that wants to destroy the, um, the mine. So they're the um, villain. And we've got a picture there of them destroying things with coal. And then the hero is the people, is the, the, the people on the front line that are resisting it. Um, it's a community and it's diverse from all walks of life. So we're try, encouraging people there. So, so in this context, we've used the framework of a, um, a drama um, triangle to be able to introduce the campaign um, before then we go in and show some examples of what's happening there. Now the hero's journey um, is a far more complex archetype. So basically, um, the um, Campbell and also other scholars have studied all the stories of history from different, not all of them, but most of the main stories of history, um, all the myths and legends and all those things. And then what, what they did is realize that there's a lot of similarities. In fact, a lot of it's the same sort of story. Um, so they pulled out all those patterns from all the stories told over generations for history and created the hero's journey. And there's a infographic on the right there. Um, so I'll let you go through that in um, your own time because it is quite complex. Um, and if you get the book on it, it's even more complex. Um, but if you want a cheat guide, you can just go watch the original Star Wars. So George Lucas just grabbed this um, story framework and then um, you know puts Luke Skywalker in it um, and Yoda and all the other characters. So that's a direct application of the hero's journey. Um, and there's also a lot of guides online for um, you know how to tell a personal story, how to um, you know shoot a story of a campaign, those sort of things. Um, but it's very important to um, start using frameworks because um, a lot of people, when they tell stories, they don't, um, they assume that the audience knows some stuff about your campaign. So it's really important that you introduce your campaign and that, that you um, tell the story in a short, concise way. And then, and I, I find it very useful in a lot of these frameworks is to use the, the, the user or the, your audience or the person you're talking to as the hero. So in this context, we're framing, um, if we expanded that a bit more, is the hero is the person that goes to the Lead State Forest to resist it. Or the hero is the person that's actually participating in the campaign to save the forest. Um, and so when I'm doing story context in forest campaigning, I'm always looking of how do I, how do I get that user to step in to be the hero of the story? Um, and our organization, our campaign is just the Yoda who's just trying to um, support them on their journey. However, it's their journey and they're the hero. Um, and I don't just want them to donate. I want them to actually go to the, to the um, actual, through the story to become the hero um, and help with the campaign. So it's also interesting to look at um, the, um, the actual um, audience as the hero. Okay, so then the, the final section I wanted to talk through is briefing creatives. So I've worked on both sides of the fence. Um, uh, and I find that um, a lot of um, creative is just ruined because um, people don't, aren't working with creatives properly. And um, more experienced creatives then develop skills on how to work with with clients and with collaborators and and get them to behave and get them to follow certain um ways of working whereas more some creatives that aren't that experienced or some creatives that are just on their own planet um which is a good thing because that's how sometimes they create good work um uh, are then unable to um facilitate a good process and then the wheels fall off and, it does, and you just don't get very good creative um, 
So the first important thing about uh, looking for creatives is find one that fits your brand. Now, graphic designers are very common. There's a lot of people in, a, in um, say, Melbourne that are graphic designers. And all of them have their own style and their own skills and their own budget. So instead of just going, oh, my mate's a graphic designer, um, how about I just call my mate up? I'd be saying, okay, how do you, does your mate's folio fit with our brand personality? Um, so for example, I was doing a, work, a job for um, elderly LGBTI um, people. Um, and so in that context, we, I was targeting specifically a graphic designer that was an elderly LGBTI person um, or um, related with them or it was experienced in that area so that then they would fit their brand personality, but then they'd also be able to resonate and actually understand a bit how to connect with that audience. And another example is if I was, had a brief for, you know, doing um, a campaign that's aimed at young, young girls or young women, then I wouldn't be the one to be doing the graphic design. I'd be looking for somebody who is already designing in that space or has that um, asset. So um, don't just go to a graphic designer, go for one that fits your brand personality and of course your budget. If, you're, if the best designer is, is a million bucks, then maybe you can't use them. So when you're working with the designer or the creative, so um, you know maybe a graphic designer or a copywriter or um, an, an artist that's going to do some illustration for you, you want to discuss with them your brand, your brand style and personality work that we've just talked about, um, so that they can um, really understand where you're coming from. Um, and you want to also talk about the emotions because if you've got a good creative, they'll, they'll be emotional and want to talk about emotions and then you can talk about, yeah, we want them to feel a certain way and that sort of thing. Now you also want to discuss their folio. You came to them because you, you believe that they're right for your brand personality. So you want to talk to them about why that is. Just be straight up. So you know, I looked at your folio and this piece here looked really good and I like this bit and um, this, this thing here is not really, um, you don't say it's not great, but you might go, this isn't on my, um, within what we're looking for. And so they can then start to tune in what you're looking for that they understand. And you might go, yeah, I want a bit like that and a bit like that. And then they might go, oh, that, that, um, that job, this was the process and this is how I did it. And so you're starting to um, start to get on the same page of being able to produce something that, that they're, they're suited to. Um, you also could then look at certain examples of their folio about what things cost. You go, okay, so we've got this much budget. So, you know, how much, you know, this and that. So yes, yeah, some things are confidential, but generally they'll give you a rough idea of, okay, for your money, we can do this much work or not do this much effort, that sort of stuff. Um, I think it's important to speak about budgets along the way because you don't want to get to the end of the process and realize you can't afford it. Um, and you don't want to get to the end of the process and then the um, designers are, well, you can't afford it or vice versa. Uh, it's really important to talk a bit about their creative process. Um, different creatives have different processes and some creatives have abstract ways of working. Um, and that's fine on how they work because what you're looking at is not um, their process, but their end goal. But if you realize that I've got some weird abstract way of working, that's good that you can put that in context when you're working with them. So that um, during that process, you're just flowing um, because you know that the end goal will get you where you're going. Um, and it's just really helpful. Um, and sometimes their creative process might be, I really need some direction here or I need some input from you there or some research there. And then you go, okay, so I can do some research or I, I can give you some input there. And then they're like, yeah, but if you give me input here, then that's really unhelpful. So um, actually I should stop sharing screen, sorry. Uh, yeah, so that's really um, helpful to understand their creative process. Um, the bigger agencies or the more professional designers will actually have very strict process on how they, um, they do things. Um, whereas some of the more um, smaller or independent designers just may have some more abstract ways of doing things. Um, you want to discuss with them the actions that you want to influence. So if you're um, creating a campaign and you want, you want um, people to come along, 
um, to get involved um, or you want them to sign up to something. So it's important for the, for the creative to understand what you're doing with the creative. So in their process, they can then um, try and put that within their, within their end goal. You also want to discuss the intended feelings of your user. Like, how do you want them to feel when they see this poster? How do you want them to feel when, when they're at the website? Um, feelings and emotions is really important to your brand personality your, um, and the effectiveness of your work. Now, most designers are a little bit more tuned in emotionally. Um, and generally, um, if you found one that's going to resonate with your brand personality, then you'll probably have one that will be happy to talk about the uh, feelings of what you're trying to do. You then want to jump to the opposite, which is the technical needs. You want to be really strict with what specifically you, you need. So we need, we need a website design, we need a Facebook header, we need um, some images for our memes, some, some layouts for our memes, um, or we want to print, we want just six different designs. So really a lot, uh, list of actually technically what the end goal is, or you might like, I want six illustrations, um, et cetera. So that way everyone really knows what's happening. The other thing you may be looking at is a design system. So this is where you've got various elements that come together to be a system. So um, in a meme generator, for example, you may have um, a, a collection of um, illustration or a collection of um, icons that you can then use um, in a part of a system way of doing it. Or maybe we're designing a website that's a system. So there's an image here, the updates, but then we have this design here and there. Timelines and budgets, that's obviously important if you want to be on time and on budget. Um, and you can also talk to them about how good they are at um, timelines and budgets. Um, some creatives will blow budget and blow timelines. So that means you're going to have to project manage them a bit more. Um, and you should start getting that idea and, and you're weaving this through the conversation. So you'll be looking at when you're looking at the folio, how's the timeline on that? What was the budget like on that? And also please don't play the budget game. Trust their folio. This is a key point because um, some people go, oh, I'm going to play this game where I'm not going to tell them how much budget because in the hope that they'll underquote themselves and I'll get it cheaper. Now, there's not many um, good creatives that work like that. They're simply not playing games. It's like, I'll work for this much time or this much energy and then you'll get um, you know, this much value. So if you come and say, I've got five grand and I'm wanted, and this is what I want to do, they can go, oh, yeah, that's a struggle. We, we may not be able to, um, but like we can cut some corners here, we can save some costs there and I'll be able to do this, at sort of this standard for that budget. And then we're always reframing of what can we do for your budget rather than like playing some game as like, and then they go, well, how much will, will it cost for me? And then maybe I don't have enough information or, um, and then I'm worried, am I gonna quote it too high or too low, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I do recommend just drop the games with um, trying to get budgets down. Um, or you might say, I've got two grand. If you can sell me and do, like you've, you give me a strong concept of why I should spend three grand, then let's do that. I mean, if you wanna play games, play it more like that. So they're like, oh, okay, well, I've got, to, I've got to sell them on a really good concept and they're willing to spend a bit more money on good creative. Um, that's a much better game to play with a creative than just the budget game. Trust their folio. You've come to them because you believe they resonate with your brand, they do good work, trust that. Okay, so then we come into the process of working with, with creatives. Um, you wanna balance the direction versus freedom. So how much you're directing them. And you need to learn how they work fast. So for example, I've got um, a photographer I work with, Jeff Tan, amazing photographer. Um, there's no way you can direct him. If you direct him, he just will rebel and, and won't work with you. Um, what you do is you tell him just the technical needs. I need this shot, I need this angle, um, and here's the um, actions we want to influence and we, this is the feeling. So we'll brief them more on that stuff and then stand back. like. And he knows what he's doing. He's good at it. He comes back with the goods every time. Um, the moment you stand there saying, oh, can you move, move like, he'll just go away. Um, another designer I work with, um, I literally will 
an illustrator, I'll literally draw, start drawing it and go, this whole one this here, I want that there, give it to him. He then draws it. Um, I'll, I'll then remix it and give it back to him. And the rules with working with um, this illustrator is that they must have the final cut and the final illustration rather than be bastardizing their work. Other um, artists I've worked with, like I've really got to micro brief them, manage them, you know, da da da. So you've got to work out how they work. Uh, this is assuming you've got um, actual creative uh, or direction skills um, to balance how much direction and how much freedom. Now, if you're not qualified or not qualified, if you don't have um, skills in this area, then let them do their job and then work out um, how you can support them and what they need to be supported. Um, now, if the process is not working, just be straight up um, and say to them, look, um, this, this isn't working. Um, can, we, can we get the ship to move? Can we change it somehow so that we can get in the direction we need? Um, because they may come back to you and go, you, you, your brief is crap and I guessed and I wasn't sure. That happens a lot. So you go, okay, cool. So then I've failed in my briefing. Maybe my brief is great. They just didn't understand it or, or whatever. So you really want to make sure, go back to the step, is the brief strong? So this is really important why you need a good brief so that they can go in the right direction. But in saying that, trust their folio. And if they're saying it's not working, but I'm on the flow, it is working. You're like, trust their folio because you went to them because they do good work. So trust that. And another really important, um, another important point is minimalism. It's elegant simplicity takes time. So as a designer, I'm a fan of uh, minimalism and um, elegant simplicity. So this is a design that just looks really simple and looks like it's meant to be. Um, that takes a lot of time. Um, so sometimes we'll do a lot of work and make something look just right. And then the client goes, what took you so long? It looks great. Sure. But then why don't you just put this there and that there? And, um, why am I paying for all this time? Um, so that is really, and it's one of the reasons I don't practice graphic design. Um, uh, commercially it's just, that is just hard for me because um, for me to do, um, yeah, good minimalist design takes time. And then people, once you get to that solution, don't understand it. So if you're looking for, um, for minimalism or elegant um, design in what you're working on, make sure that you understand that that takes time. Um, so I'm doing these free webinars, um, pay what you feel. So in the email you'll see at the bottom, um, there's a link to my donation form. If you feel that it is valuable, um, if not, then, um, sharing our work or liking our stuff on social media is really appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, and if you've got any questions, um, I'm happy to stay online and to answer your questions.